Hello, everyone. This is Matt Britton. Um, I'm waiting for my special guest, Lindsay Mather, to join. She should be popping on any second now. Um, and we are here today to talk about um, the future of the home. Here's Lindsay right here. Hi, Lindsay. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, this is our, today's special guest, uh, Lindsay Mather, who's the deputy editor of the Domino Media Group. Uh, Lindsay, where are you? Um, I was about to say Zooming in for today, but we use a different <laughs> platform. But uh, where are you calling in from today? And tell us a little bit about Domino Media Group. Yeah, I'm calling in from Manhattan. I'm in the financial district. I've been here all through quarantine. Um, so yeah, still here um, working remotely. And Domino is a bunch of things, but essentially a website and quarterly magazine. And we're all about helping people bring their style home. So through host, house tours, DIYs, shopping guides, you know, inspiration and service driven stories. Um, and we're, you know, showcasing experts and tastemakers and helping our audience discover their design aesthetic through our content. Very cool. And, you know, we wanted Lindsay to join today because our topic is about the home. The home has become um, people's sort of salvation um, f throughout this quarantine and throughout this crisis. Totally. And the home has become um, part office, part school, part <laughs> bar, part nightclub, uh, really. You Definitely know, bar. Um, and people have been spending a lot more, not only time in the home, but money on the home. And this obviously impacts so many different categories, not just the categories that would come to your mind, whether it be people spending more on furniture or home electronics, but also spending more on everything from gaming to education related equipment to, to the home itself and, and spending more on buying new homes and remodeling and all sorts of things, as well as what they do in the home, cooking and things of that nature. So it really impacts um, home it, uh, you know, ho the home market impacts so many different categories that we thought for today's state of the consumer version 10, that that would be an ideal focus. So thanks so much for Lindsay, uh, for joining Lindsay. It's great to have an yeah. uh, expert on the home. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are at Suzy, we are a real time market research platform that helps the world's leading brands put their finger on the pulse of the consumer in real time to really understand what the consumer is thinking and feeling um, at any given moment. And of course, we used our tool as well as a host of third party research to come up with today's presentation. Uh, we've been running these state of the consumer webinars since March, since the very beginning of the pandemic. In fact, our first state of the consumer webinar was March 3rd, actually in our office. Um, and we kind of knew that was going to be the last one we did in our office. And they've been very popular ever since. And we really appreciate all the feedback um, from partners and clients and um, you know other people in the market research industry in terms of how much value they've been getting. Um, through these webinars, and we're going to continue to do them as we head uh, into the fall. Today, uh, we uh, basically conducted a study to base the presentation on, uh, which was conducted on August 10th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans. The samples are directionally representative of U.S. consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that out of the way, Let's speak mm -hmm. about the home. Um, as I mentioned earlier, over the past six months, America has really been home more than ever before. Um, I can speak to it personally. I never thought I'd be spending so much time at home. I was somebody who was always on the road, always traveling, always out meeting with customers and with our team. And now, you know, suddenly we found ourselves um, all together sort of packed in. It's definitely had a lot of impacts, obviously, from a business standpoint, but also from a personal and social development standpoint, especially with younger children who are obviously going through these yeah. unprecedented times in a way that we've never thought. Yeah. And would. parents handling their younger children being at that's, home. That's for sure. Working. Yep. Um, and I thought this was interesting, Lindsay, and we talked about this, but 77% of people are actually spending more time at home regardless of the ease restrictions. So, you know, since the restrictions have started to ease, I th is this a kind of the new normal? Is that they just are used to it and that they don't want to leave? What's your thoughts on that, Lindsay? <laughs> I think, you know, easing restrictions doesn't necessarily mean everyone feels super comfortable yet. So I think people are kind of you know, taking their time, getting back into the swing of things. And given it's summer also, I think yeah. people are taking advantage of th this time at home to, you know, be outside in their backyard and kind of spend more time with family. It'll be interesting to see what happens in fall when we're kind of 
slightly going back to normal, I guess. We'll see what happens. I mean, this fall overall, when you bring in the impact of the social unrest and the election, yeah and the pandemic and people going back to schools, we are about to see, you know, a four month period from s- September through December, really, um, and into January into the inauguration that we've never seen in American history. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. people think that we are now seeing some type of light of day in terms of this pandemic, in terms of business. And I think the disruption has really just started and we almost went into a you know a hideaway lockdown period from March until the summer. The summer we kind of got used to it, but no one really had to go back to work or school yet. And you know companies are remote. And now all of a sudden there is going to be a rush, despite what you hear about people moving out of the cities. There's still a lot of people that are going back to cities. A lot of people mm-hmm. that are going back to school. And we've already mm-hmm. started to see some early indications um, with you know New- University of North Carolina Chapel Hill yesterday after one yeah. week college kids Crazy. back to school are now shutting down automatically. And I think you're going to start to happen over and over again. The NFL wants to have games. What's going to happen with that? There's just so much unknown. Um, Consumers, despite the fact that they um, have begun to ease restrictions and they they can leave, as you mentioned, Lindsay Moore, staying home, and they are overwhelmingly bored. Consumers are still bored. It doesn't matter how many things are on Netflix. (laughs) They still are are searching for things to do because we were living in a world before this pandemic of constant movement, of constant change, constant travel. Um, Travel had had become more accessible to more um, people around the world and more Americans than ever before, not just domestically, but internationally. So now, not to mention, you know, nightlife and concerts and entertainment Mm -hmm. and sports and all the things that people used to go to. You know, we were in living in the experience economy. And the experience economy basically deflated, it. And that's a big part of people's lives. So despite the fact we have more options than ever before at home to entertain ourselves, it's no surprise that Americans still are saying they are indeed uh, still bored. Um, yeah. and basically, it, you know, we've had, as I mentioned, you know, less entertainment and options. And this is very much going to continue. I mean, the tech companies have really led the charge um, from the work from home movement. Um, Google recently um, reinforced that you know, their employees aren't going to be coming back to the office until at least June of next year. And that is going to continue to be pushed back. I think you're very much going to start to see more companies start to say that the year of 2021 is going to be a work from home year. I hate to say it. We're not there yet. Uh, Susie, we were running. We're not there yet either. (laughs) No, we're not there yet. And, you know, we're all hopeful in terms of the scientific and medical community, um, you know, really coming to save the day um, and allowing us to all come back in. I think for larger corporations, they're thinking about things like liability. They're thinking about costs. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, Facebook, when they announced the ability to work from home, what Facebook did, which was highly controversial and said, they said, you can move out to San Francisco, but we're going to cost adjust your salary for the cost of living or wherever you're going to move. I think the point of this all is that, you know, people are going to be working from home for much longer than what we think. We are not all going to come back to work in January. I think some companies will, many won't. And this notion of staying at home and home being sort of everything from the office to the school to the nightclub is going to continue into at least 2021. Um, So it's something that I think businesses need to understand. I don't know if you had further thoughts on that, Lindy, but just fascinating in terms of how long this is happening. (laughs) Um, So, you know, less available activities and distractions have resulted, obviously, in a new attention to home. And consumers are taking a closer look at their home for that reason. They are evaluating the footprint of their home. You know, do they have enough space uh, for them to be able to function as a family? Um, You know, many, especially millennials, had given up sort of the space and privacy that suburban lifestyles have brought them for the connectivity and the community of cities, but now the connectivity and the community is short circuited. No longer. <laughs> right. So now that's why we're obviously seeing all these articles about, you know, the mass exodus out of San Francisco and New York to the suburbs yeah. while we're seeing home prices in suburban areas really skyrocket because mm-hmm. people want to be more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And people want to invest more in their home. Um, and because of that, they're really taking a look at their home as a big part of their overall personal inventory in terms of what matters to me in this new world. 
and what can I do about it? And again, they are also speaking very loudly with their wallets in terms of what they're um, spending their money on as well. Um, so we're gonna explore during this webinar today how the home has changed over the last six months and really understand the new role of the home, what are the drivers of change and what the future of the home looks like. What does this look like moving forward into the months and even years ahead? Um, because again, the home has taken on a completely new meeting uh, for the consumers. So first we're gonna talk about the new role of the home. And first we're gonna ask you guys, as we always do, we have this Ask America section where it gives you, the viewer, the ability to tell us what you wanna know from consumers using our Suzy on-demand software platform. So which of these four questions do you want us to ask our Suzy panel? First and foremost, what is your favorite at-home activity uh, since the start of the pandemic been? Where in the house are you spending most of your time? Do you love home more or less since the start of the pandemic? And are you getting used to staying so much time at home? So why don't you pick the question you wanna have answered? And at the end of this webinar, we're actually gonna have answers uh, for the most popular question um, that everybody selects in this poll. And we are gonna move on. Thanks for filling that out. So over 50% of Americans say their home has taken on a new role. Um, this quote from Allison Petty of Hyphen & Company kind of says it all. And much like I was saying, our homes are becoming the new offices, classrooms, restaurants, and bars. And our remodels are reflecting that. One of the main areas and one of the biggest beneficiaries um, of the quarantine era and it is an error at this point, is nearly half of consumers have repurposed areas of their home to replace the gym. Um, we had a sort of health and healthy eating craze that was going on pre-pandemic. And that's only example, uh, you know, it's only a bigger issue now because people are so much more health conscious because of the pandemic that happened, which is why half of consumers have prioritized repurposing areas of their home to replace the gym. Obviously, the mm -hmm. gym itself is not accessible in most cities right yeah. now. Um, and in many, a, a, or many really suburbs, and in many places in cities, consumers can even have their backyard. They don't have anywhere to work out. They don't feel safe going to the park. So they need to create a gym out of their actual house. Um, this was really interesting. A company called Mirror, which is basically um, a smart device, which allows you to basically have a personal trainer, much like Peloton, except it's for uh, more cardio and traditional weights. Uh, this company really took off as did Peloton um, and many other competitors during the pandemic. Even SoulCycle has created a Peloton competitor. And it should come as no surprise that Mirror was swallowed up by Lululemon uh, for half a billion dollars. And for Lululemon, it makes so much sense because what I'm thinking you're going to start to see uh, in terms of an accelerant of this pandemic is many companies that were in, let's just say, the software space um, are going to get into hardware. So, and it doesn't mean just technology companies. Lululemon is a company that sells, um, you know, athletic apparel and have built a great brand. And what they're doing is they're taking license with that brand to extend the consumer touch point. And by buying a company like Mirror, now they're in consumers' homes. They're collecting more data in terms of how consumers are exercising. They're coming in at a higher price point. And it's only going to allow them to build out their core business. And I think you're going to start to see this happen in many other industries. I think you're going to start to see a company maybe like Spotify that streams music by Sonos that has music hardware. Um, so I think having the hardware in the home as more and more people spend time in the home is going to make more and more sense. And I think this was a great move by Lululemon and one you're going to start to see continue, not just across the fit fitness industry, but many other industries at the same time. Um, this is, uh, you know, an interior designer said, we just finished a project last week in the West Village. We converted a sitting area that was never used into a full on gym with layered rubble floors to protect the hardware underneath and all the equipment need to get a good sweat in. I mean, what are your yeah. thoughts about these redesigns happening in the house where yeah. gyms are being fitted? Lindsay? That's a quote from a story we did where we tapped designers on, you know, what they saw the future of home looking like from a design perspective. And she's. Becky told us also that, you know, repurposing unused corners is something, a common request she's getting at this point. It's not just this one project. And uh, we actually did a separate story based on this about what people can do. And I think they're really looking for space saving. Um, as you said, I'm, you know, I have no gym, even though I live in an apartment building, it's closed. So I've got my little living room nook and that's it. So people are using pegboards to hang their equipment to get rid of, right. um, like to have that valuable real estate on the floor uh, left open. Um, they're adding plants to try to distract from like not so pretty dumbbells, et cetera. So yeah, people are looking for those solutions for sure. 
Um, 44% of the people who leave their homes have taken the role of restaurants despite reopening. We've talked ad nauseum over <laughs> our webinars in terms of the impact of the pandemic on the gazillion dollar food and beverage industry and how this pandemic has created far more comfort in the home um, with people preparing and cooking their own food. Uh, we went through a 50 year period where the amount of food consumed out of home at the end of the 50 year cycle overtook the amount of food consumed in the home. And now what we've actually obviously started to see is a huge reversal of that, where people are far more comfortable cooking for themselves. Um, they are still ordering in a lot, but they're obviously not going to restaurants. And it's really um, kind of put the role of the kitchen in the American household front and center as a gathering place, as sort of like a communal activity for the family to come together at the end of each day, almost bringing us back to the 50s all over again, right? Where yeah. you know, American families, they would always eat together. Right. And then we entered a world of takeout and multi, um, you know, income families where people were working and everyone was kind of doing their own things. And it's kind of brought us, um, you know, back to the past in some ways. Yeah, it's interesting. We actually uh, reached out to a bunch of meal kit services back in June to see how they were doing. And as you probably expect, Sun Baskets orders have doubled both new uh, customers and old ordering more and Blue Apron had a 9% bump in their first quarter. So we're really seeing um, people wanting to try to cook even if they were all about ordering before. Absolutely. And, and companies like Shake Shack, which obviously had a tremendous business before the pandemic and have really struggled, um, you know, because they have, um, you know, affluent urban locations across the country where they have their Shake Shack locations where they've been decimated. And what they tried to do as part of their pivot is, is have a kit where you can cook your own Shake Shack burgers at home. So really trying to keep their brand front and center, almost to tread water, so to speak, but to make sure that their brand, the brand equity is not forgotten about and really empower consumers. So to provide those meal kits, I think it's interesting that brands are bringing that to light um, as well. At home entertainment obviously has been a, a huge part of this overall pandemic. It, it really plays into the boredom that consumers have been feeling. Um, nearly half have reimagined their home as movie theaters. Uh, you know, you go back to the, to the 80s and the 90s and there was a huge home theater boom uh, when it became accessible. And while there's certainly been a big push for home entertainment um, with consumers on the go and with them having their mobile devices and their iPads, it, it just sort of became less important because people were really consuming content everywhere. But now it's not being yeah. consumed everywhere. This is the right? only place to watch sports it's like, or movies absolutely. at this point. So obviously you look at the boom of a company like Netflix. And one thing we've seen through this is more com consumers have gotten comfortable with streaming services. Um, it's really brought it, it was already mainstream before this, but platforms like Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus, and now there's Peacock, NBC streaming mm -hmm. platform, right. uh, HBO Max. Um, the, you know, it's really allowed these streaming companies to have their heyday. I was reading a story in the New York Times this past weekend where they're basically proclaiming that it's the end of Hollywood. Hollywood, as we know, it, is over. The power has shifted from Hollywood to technology companies. It's about the distribution um, so much more. And because of that, so many studio execs that were at, at, you know, at these studios for 20, 30 years were laid off um, over a Zoom call almost like unceremoniously. Um, and it just really started to reinforce how the power dynamics have shifted. Obviously, you have these major movie studios that are trying to come out with blockbuster releases that aren't able to drive the same revenue as bringing people to the theater. Um, right. And a lot of, even though consumers do miss the movie theaters, which we'll get into in a second. So it's really reimagined Hollywood and really put the power in the hands of the Jeff Bezos of the world um, and the Netflix of the world to basically take control of the future of entertainment uh, for better um, or for worse. Talk about movie theaters. Um, we had asked consumers when the pandemic ends, like what's the first thing you want to do? Well, you know, when you, when life gets back to normal and you could see go to a movie was like popped up. And, you know, all we heard going into this was movie theaters are dead, the end of the movie theaters. But I think, you know, and we're starting to see, you know, obviously a lot. I miss of, it. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people are talking about drive-in theaters now in terms of, so yeah. I think miss that. And I think, you know, so I don't know if movie theaters are done and maybe there's room for a renaissance coming out of it, but that was certainly interesting to see. Um, AMC is starting to go back in the game, reopening its theaters uh, next week with 15 cent tickets. I mean, whether a company like that's going to be able to last uh, sort of remains to be seen. Um, so that that's going to be interesting to see what happens in the, in the movie theater space. But 
what consumers are doing in the absence of being able to go into movie theaters is creating on their own at home. Obviously, gaming has had a massive explosion, um, whether it be Fortnite or Roblox or Minecraft, uh, which have basically taken over. Any parent who has a Gen Z kid can tell you that those are verbs in the house used far too many times, including um, I actually had to rip my son off of Fortnite to join this webinar today. Um, but these are these games are quite immersive and they're also social. Kids are playing with it uh, with their friends and it's really brought home entertainment to a new level. And these gaming companies have seen sort of unlimited demand as sort of the ultimate source of home entertainment. It's sort of like if if there could be the ultimate situation for a gaming company to thrive, totally. it would be people can't leave the home, right? Because <laughs> what, what their dream. Home? It's a dream, especially and th th before the NBA came back. It's like I'm a sports fan. I mean, I had a craving that I couldn't get filled through NBA oh, games. I played was a blue time here for my fiance. So uh, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure. So, um, so, so we talked about entertainment. We talked about Jim. Where are people spending time in the home? Um, and to no surprise, the younger adults are spending most of their time in their bedroom. Um, kids, you know, love the privacy of their bedroom and they're closing the doors and they're going into their own rooms and they're communicating with their friends. And that's kind of their, their place they want to be. Um, a lot of kids don't want to be around their parents or their siblings nonstop. <laughs> and for them to have their room, they sort of have refocused on their room and made that where they want to work out of and where they want to, um, you know, live out of and communicate with their friends. And thankfully in this day and age, there's so many things kids can do without ever leaving the bedroom um, where in the past, not even a telephone would be in a kid's bedroom, right? They'd have to go downstairs right. to the living room actually to access the telephone where now there's nothing they can access for good or for bad um, just by never even leaving their bedroom. And that's why more than half actually want to spend there. Uh, but 46% of people are, uh, you know, have chosen the living room as sort of their place of being. I don't know if you had thoughts in terms of the layout of the home or which rooms, Lindsay, um, people are really prioritizing living in. Well, that doesn't surprise me because our living room, as you were saying right at the beginning, is our office, our playroom, soon to be the school. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially in cities, um, are having to use this one space in a lot of different ways. And so that doesn't surprise me that they're um, spending most of their time there. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, with the home being so focused, cleaning has taken on a, a paramount role. I was reading yesterday mm -hmm. about uh, a partnership with Clorox and the NBA. And you're starting to see um, Lysol doing co-branded partnerships with airlines. And, you know, brands like Lysol and Clorox has become really the stars of the pandemic, right? In terms of people refocusing on keeping their home cl um, clean and disinfecting. And mm -hmm. that has not changed. I mean, the demand on these companies from consumers who want to make sure that despite the fact that may, they might not even have guests over, they, they need to make sure that their home is disinfected has really put cleaning um, front and center. 64% um, of consumers have given their home a deep clean themselves. Um, you know, we talk about DIY and many consumers aren't comfortable maybe having cleaning help uh, in their home, which they right. may have asked. So they're doing it themselves. They're learning how to do these things themselves. And they're learning maybe buying these brands in the past where they haven't really had to focus much more uh, as much, you know, dual income household mm -hmm. at a time to clean their home and outsource it. Now are figuring out that they need to do it on their own. Right. So, uh, that's obviously driving a huge boom. So in, in summary, you know, the role of new home is it's going to continue to take on a central home. The kitchen is the restaurant alternative. Uh, food brands really need to reimagine themselves as ingredient brands. And obviously entertainment is only going to become more important in winter months as well. So I think, you know, when people can't go outside, it's going to, as they weren't able to in March, you're going to start to see even a bigger spike now of, for streaming, gaming and in-home activities as well. So now we're going to go towards what has changed, but uh, now we're gonna, before that, we're going to go to the second section of Ask America, and you, it's time for you to tell us uh, what question you want us to ask about consumers or what has changed. One, are you enjoying staying home more now than the start of the pandemic? Two, do you plan to host a smaller holiday gathering this year in 2019? You know the answer to that one. Three, how likely are you to invest in home improvement in the next six months? And four, how much do you plan on spending on home improvement in the next six months? So we want to see, you know, how consumers are looking at spending their money um, and their time differently in the home. So, Lindsay, this quote was from your magazine. You want to speak to it? Yeah, um, I mean, it speaks for itself. But I think while we've seen, like, the New York Times reporting how many people are leaving the city, I think many others are 
really seeing this as an opportunity to make their home exactly what they want and need it to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 80, over 80% of consumers have been making home improvements since mm -hmm. the start um, of COVID. They've been doing everything from sanding down, um, you know, their, their coffee tables to repainting to doing yeah. touch-ups with all the time they have. They're looking at every detail of their home as really a place to focus and really feel in control amidst the world that seems quite chaotic. If you think about mm -hmm. it, there's so much right now that we can't control about this world in this geopolitical chaotic landscape. Uh, the one place that you can control is your sanctuary in your home. Yeah. In that yeah, home, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what the news says or what's going on outside. That's what you can control. And because mm -hmm. of it, it, it gives consumers sort of a sense of peace in doing that. And I think that's a big reason why. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, and you know, they they want to also change the, the role of their home and relook at it because, as we mentioned earlier, there, there are new roles of the home. Um, so what we're finding, though, is despite the pandemic. This is shocking. <laughs> 39% of consumers are hosting more than they did pre-COVID. And that may be shocking, but actually if you take a step back and think about it, it's because what consumers can't go anywhere. So if they want to meet up with friends, they can go to a restaurant. Okay, well, right, that's do true. We're doing it. They can't go meet their friends at a bar. That there's not, you know, they're not seeing their friends at work. Um, and they can't travel or go anywhere. So as a result of those things, if they want to be social, really the only place they can do so is at their home, which means mm -hmm. hosting. So um, and now what we've heard a lot of is many families putting these pods together of other families that they kind of trust this summer. So their kids can have right. friends, et cetera. But people are doing more hosting than than maybe people will admit yeah so you know the shaming that goes on in social media if you <laughs> no shaming here yeah well so what happens is people don't post it so it's just not something that people understand is happening but it, but it, but it really is um because so many people are hosting at home we see many industries boom um and you know you look at the liquor and spirits business you know it's really a tale um of kind of two different cities with them right you have their on-premise business which is their bars and nightclubs and restaurants that have it's gone obviously through the floor they've had a they've had a terrible time being able to service the on-premise business because there really is no on-premise business but at the same time since people are hosting more at home drinking more at home you know their off-premise business or people actually purchasing alcohol for consumption at home has gone through the roof and there's been many beneficiaries, um, including a company called Bevy, which is up over 100%, which which partners with local stores to offer you the lowest prices on alcohol for stocking up your personal bar, and they deliver directly to you. Uh, Drizzly is another one where you know Amazon has not gone really deep into the alcohol delivery space, and it's created room for other entrants to come in, um, like Bevy, and and they've done tremendously well. And I think you're going to continue to see companies. We talk about them looking at their home, like a nightclub or a bar, and you know, there's going to be beneficiaries of this. And I know that a lot of the liquor companies and beer companies are really trying to pivot towards this um, because. You know, while there's Instacart for consumers getting groceries delivered, there wasn't much adoption going into this of alcohol delivery. Uh, and this has really accelerated that. And there's certainly going to be some winners coming out of that. 50% um, of people are making improvements, um, are planning on updating two areas, really, the living room um, and the kitchen, uh, because they, as we've mentioned earlier, has really become sort of the central gathering spaces or the multi-use spaces in the home. So we talk about consumers looking at their home, the way they're being used and how they're going to invest. Those are really the two areas that they're looking at. Um, they've done a lot of what we'll call low effort upgrades, because also at the same time, we are going into an economic downturn. So it's not like consumers have endless discretionary expenditures to upgrade their homes. So right. many of them are starting small. You know, they're doing things. And that's like why we see paint doing so well. Um, it's literally one of the easiest, most affordable ways to completely transform a space. Um, so it's no surprise there that we're seeing an uptick in sales. So are consumer, they're painting their own homes, you're saying? That they're, yeah, they're but yeah. I mean, I should do it here, clearly, um, I, it's yeah. a little color, but uh, yeah, it, and, and we recommend that to every reader. It's just a very empowering, easy thing to do that yep. is very uh, impactful. Yep. So the low hanging fruits, I mean, we obviously decoration, linens, mm -hmm. small appliances, uh, right. furniture, workout equipment. We talked about larger points. I mean, these are companies um, that if you manufacture products 
in the, any of these spaces. Um, you know, if you're Ikea, if you're a West Elm, um, if you're Whirlpool and you're making appliances for the home, this should be a time where you should be stepping on the gas because consumers are really reinvesting um, in this space uh, for what we call low effort um, upgrades. Obviously, you see platforms like Etsy that have exploded right now uh, as consumers really want to get much more creative. You know, Etsy is a place where you can buy um, everything from uh, wall decor to, to um, outdoor garden um, equipment to really unique face masks. And these are all sort of things that were homemade crafts by other people. Um, Etsy stock has exploded since the start of the pandemic. People have more time to basically, instead of just buying sort of the standard thing from the standard store, they're going into Etsy, they're looking at their home, they want something completely custom because they have time to think through those things. Yeah. And that's why Etsy's doing so incredibly well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think people are, especially with, you know, the protests and everything that's been going on lately um, with social justice, I think people are really thinking about where they're putting their dollar and, and you know, there's power in that and supporting a small business owner is, is a way to, you know, make yeah, it. Yeah, great point. The flip side of that is an independent seller, independent mm -hmm. person that is maybe trying to, maybe they got laid off or maybe it's a side gig and you're also supporting them as well. So I think yeah. that's, it really works on both sides of that marketplace uh, with Etsy. Obviously outdoor spaces have become more important mm -hmm. than ever before. If people um, are obviously less reluctant to go to parks and they're staying at home and they're spending so much time upgrading their outdoor space. Um, three, three quarters of consumers do have a private outdoor space to retreat at home. Um, you know, city Lovely. dwellers, not so much the case. Um, you know, <laughs> I talked to a realtor recently in the New York area and they're saying the one place they still have tremendous demand is apartments and townhomes that have outdoor space in New York city. Oh, uh, sure. because if you, yeah. Because I mean, that's, that's just everything where if you're stuck inside all day, people need fresh air. That's where the demand is um, in city areas, but you know, still across America, three quarters of the consumers do yeah. have that private outdoor space. Um, online inquiries for homes with pools are up threefold homes with outdoor spaces were up twofold in in q3 so consumers are looking and they're looking at buying new homes they're thinking about pools they're thinking about homes with outdoor spaces because you know they want a world where they can keep their family entertained and give them plenty of outdoor activities because there's so much uncertainty in terms of how long this is actually going to continue um the people who do have outdoor spaces over half have made updates to their outdoor space. So if you think about companies like Lowe's and Home Depot, um, which are really big in terms of the outdoor space and beautification, or even companies that um, are selling lawn and garden improvement products, um, you know, there's there's so much demand there because gardening has obviously taken on a renewed focus. Many people want to grow their own um, fruits and vegetables in the back of their home. Right. Really, be really don't need to go to a restaurant then. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's been a huge and urban gardening as well. So there's been a huge boom um, in that uh, for people to really take control of their outdoor space as well and reinvest. And again, all of this is discretionary expenditures that are coming out of the pockets of airlines and hotels and um, you know sporting events and concerts and really the experience economy. Right. I mean, if you think about it, uh, we, we've heard that save personal saving rates are at an all time high uh, over the last 20 years right now because people don't have those big expenditures anymore. Um, they're not making the big expenditures and they're not spending money on travel and they're redirecting it towards their own home. That's where the money is coming from. So even an economic downturn, there are pl there's plenty of space for demand with the consumer because of all the things they're not able to spend um, during these times. Um, so yard work and gardening have been the number one way to make a quick improvement. Um, great family activity outdoors. Obviously, that might change as we head um, into the you know the colder months of the year. Um, consumers are loving the home improvement process. You know the famous uh, Lowe's quote: "You can do it. We can help." Right is. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it made so much sense. And we went through this home improvement boom, then sort of moved away with it as we had so much more new construction that happened in suburban areas um, across America. But now we're seeing this renaissance of home improvement. Um, many consumers are figuring out how to do things that they once relegated to an outsource um, you know, service. So whether it's changing their oil in their car or, or um, grooming their pet, or if it's actually <laughs> changing, changing their, a light fixture, changing light fixture or, or fixing their toilet or, you know, whatever it may be there, there's YouTube now and they have the ability to learn yeah. things. And it's really empowering consumers again, to take that into their own hands, how this will affect other services uh, coming out of this 
it, it remains to be seen. I mean, we've seen mm -hmm. consumers learning how to dye their hair and, and do things at home where they're saying, well, maybe I don't need a spa anymore coming out of it. You know, we've seen consumers making their favorite coffee at home and they're saying, well, maybe I don't need Starbucks coming out of this. So I think the flip side of this for many businesses that provide services is that many consumers may say, you know what, I want to be more self-sufficient. We went to a world where we're outsourcing everything to now we actually have to figure everything else out ourselves and home improvement right. is definitely part of that. So um, what do consumers uh, want to help brands with? Um, Lindsay, if you had uh, thoughts on this uh, topic, but it's definitely a big topic that we uncovered here. Yeah. Um, so I think tech is one place where people are definitely looking for solutions. As Alison Petty says again here, um, Zoom calls and uh, meetings are the new norm, as we know, as we're on this call. Um, and so soundproofing, really good Wi-Fi, um, like smart lighting that, that yeah. like helps with like, you know, setting your productivity and getting into your work. I think all of those uh, smart home uh, products are really going to see some interest. Absolutely. I was talking and to a friend of mine. Already. I was talking to a friend of mine who's working on the biggest business deal of her life. And I was on a Zoom call with her and the sound was terrible and the lighting was terrible. And she looked like she was in a cave. And I was saying, well, you're not going to look like this for the meeting, are you? She's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, no, 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 no. You have to do something about it. And I think many people just don't know how. So whether it's the layout of the room or the technology setup, you know, just how you want to look professional in a work setting physically, uh, before this, you want to look that way virtually during this. And I think mm -hmm. it's something that many consumers need help with. They also need help with hyper-specialized rooms. Tell us about that, Lindsay. Yeah, I think there are, um, I mean, if you're in the city, it's enough. But if you are have this space, you need a room for homeschooling. You need um, a room to take those calls separately so that, you know, your kids aren't running around behind you necessarily. Right. Um, so I think actually people are wanting you know open concept living spaces were such a big thing for so long and you know designers are telling us that people are actually wanting closed off spaces and you know maybe the dining room is separate from the kitchen um, yeah. so it's going to be really interesting to see with renovations how that plays out yep yeah. um parents obviously are still feeling not prepared uh, for the upcoming school year in terms of home preparation. And this is a big issue. Yeah. It's a big issue for employees that, um, you know, have kids at home and they're supposed to work and, you know, they're supposed to support their family, but yet they have young children that really need help. And, you know, I think this is going to be a huge issue heading into the fall. Um, it's not new news, but, you know, the lack of um, childcare options as parents are expected to work from home, yet make sure their kids are staying focused in a remote learning environment. Um, you know, parents really need help in terms of, and what does that look like for creating a home that's conducive to remote learning is another thing that, um, you know, I think that many parents really need to figure out. I think, you know, that there's tremendous demand. Obviously, we talk about the kitchen for restaurant great kitchen is parents are really, as we mentioned earlier, creating their own restaurants at home and they're cooking mm -hmm. nonstop uh, versus maybe you'd cook at home a couple times a week. Now parents are cooking every meal at home constantly. So they have to really <laughs> reimagine what the kitchen looks like. And that's obviously creating a lot of demand in terms of kitchen remodeling and new kitchen related equipment yeah. um, that's, that's going into the home. And pantries too. I feel like that the, the side of like the extra part of that is where do you put all your, you know, cans of beans that you stocked up on and, um, you know, all that extra food. And so people are really looking for organized pantry solutions. Absolutely. I mean, it, going and storage in general, how do, how do I, especially in- Oh yeah, storage is a big one. Yeah, I mean, you saw retailers like Costco explode in volume and Costco sells volume style products and that mm -hmm. means you're more space in the home and right. there's a lot of stuff gonna go. Um, exactly. So storage solutions and things like that is a whole nother thing. So in terms of what's changed, consumers are hosting more, putting emphasis on shared spaces. Outdoor space has become more important than ever before. Technology is going to continue to dominate the home office space and it's a place where consumers really need help. Uh, consumers are looking at hyper-specializing rooms for specific functions like remote learning. And the kitchen's really taking on the role of the restaurant, which is really you know driving the need for restaurant-worthy upgrades um, from consumers. And that's an area where it's not just companies that make um, home appliances, it's you know the companies that sell food in the food and beverage space can help consumers think about the kitchen. Uh, you know, If I'm a brand, again, I'm in the food and beverage space, I'm thinking about how can my brand be an ingredient brand and how can I actually help consumers you know, 
create uh, you know, a world in which you can use those ingredients to create meals in a great environment for your family. And I think it's a huge opportunity for brands for sure. So lastly, we're going to talk about the future of the home uh, with the time that we have left. And first, we're going to ask America um, what question you want to know. Uh, first, what innovations do you hope to see from brands for your future home? What aspect of the home do you anticipate to be more important moving forward? How much has your idea of your future home changed since the onset of COVID? And how comfortable are you with buying major purchases for the home digitally? So answer uh, what you want us to ask our audience and we'll get back to the rest of the presentation. So 40% of consumers are planning more substance of home improvements in the near future because of all this because now the pandemic is now in month five consumers have had time to sort out their personal finances we're not in a time of as much uncertainty certainly as we were in march and april and consumers are now planning out their budgets for the rest of this year as well as for 2021 and in that regard starting to think about hmm, maybe i should start to um you know invest in home improvements, especially with mortgage um, and interest rates in all time low as well, as well as refinance rates. Many consumers are tapping into home equity lines um, and refinancing their homes to free up capital to reinvest in the homes. So for those who can't afford to buy um, you know, a, a vacation home or, or to move, um, they're, they're saying, okay, with the home that I have, how do I actually um, reinvest in it? So because of it, what can we expect from home behavior uh, pro, uh, post-crisis? One thing we've definitely seen is the home buying process change. So many homes have now been bought sight unseen. Um, and the real estate industry really has had to respond very quickly to, to the notion that people who were selling their homes did not want to have live showings of random people walking through their homes. Right. So a host of new technologies, and Lindsay, maybe you want to speak to this, have come up to allow homes to be shown virtually. Yeah, I mean, I think it was used before, but not to the degree that it is now. Yeah. And I think real estate agents are really going to have to adapt to this new way of showing homes. And, you know, um, I think it might be the next slide, but it's not just home buying. Nope, not the next slide, but I will say, yeah. Oh yeah, um, it's not just home buying that's going digital. Um, we actually just wrote a story on this tool called Remote Assist by this um, site called HomeX, which is all about virtual um, home improvements. And as you were actually saying, you know, people are trying to tackle these things themselves. And this um, tool is meant to be like a video chat phone call with an expert who can walk you through, let's say, how to fix your AC and um, do it for you without coming to your home ever. And so, especially with social it's distancing. Like it's like telehealth for your stuff. Yeah, telehealth for, right. for your leaky faucet. Um, yep. So yeah, it's really interesting to see how people are adapting digitally. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot, I get asked all the time by our customers, what, what type of content should we put out to better engage our consumer? It's this stuff. If I am a technology company, I you know, if I'm Hewlett Packard um, or if I'm Samsung, I am push, I am pushing content out and having services like this that allow consumers to build the per perfect home office and let your brand be behind that because that's what consumers need right now. They need that expert advice and the insights to help better their lives. And I think that's a it's a great opportunity for brands to come in as that trusted source to really be able to help them. Mm -hmm. um, so how will tomorrow's technologies redefine the way that we live at home? Um, spaces obviously are gonna continue to be multi-purpose. I think the home gym is gonna be something that is going to be much more standard and commonplace um, in American homes. And we're seeing that in the stock price of Peloton, but I think gyms will likely be one of the last um, kind of sectors that truly recover from this just because of you know the, the cleanliness and hy hygienic aspect of being in a gym. And I think it's gonna be a long time before consumers are comfortable going to a sweaty gym with other people. But physical fitness at the same time is taking on a renewed interest among consumers. So I think home gyms is, go is gonna be really here to stay. And it's gonna drive multi-purpose homes um, in that you know, multi-purpose spaces in the home. Um, design's gonna get personal. Um, I think, you know, the interior design software market, for example, is projected to reach um, over $6 billion in the next five years. What does that mean? It means that consumers don't want cookie cutter designs for the home. They want the home to be as unique as the people that live in them themselves. And they want to be able, that's why they're going to Etsy. That's why they're trying to pick out custom um, designs for their home, but they need help doing it. So it's really uh, much like looking at a, a, bl a blank space or blank canvas. Consumers are looking at their home and how can this be a reflection of me? Again, it's my sanctuary. It's one thing I can control. I want to reflect who I 
am and, and my lifestyle. And I think it's going to drive much more personal design um, from consumers and and really drive demand for services and tools that can help deliver on consumers bring personal design. So in summary here, home buying and home improvement will continue to go digital. Brands have to adapt to stay relevant. Multi-purpose rooms are going to result in you know multi-purpose furniture and accessories and customization is going to be key moving forward. Um, so we're going to go into Q and A um, in a second, but I don't know, Abel, if you want to pop on and show us some of the uh, answers we've gotten to um, you know the the Ask America segment. Hey guys, I'm excited to share the results. Uh, you. By the way, Abel from the Suzy Marketing Team, so say hello to Abel. Hey. <laughs> Uh, so excited to share. So again, this is the Suzy platform here that we run all the research uh, that is used to really power these surveys uh, that are in this webinar. So the questions that you guys want to know us the most about are, uh, how much do you plan to spend on home improvement in the next six months? Uh, we saw that majority of people were uh, less than $500, uh, but there still is kind of a, a rising group of people, almost 40% that are looking to spend uh, over $1,000. So as people kind of continue to think about uh, the place of their uh, you know, home, they're definitely looking at how they can continue to invest in that. Um, the next question that you guys wanted to know about is what has been your favorite at home activity since the start of the pandemic? Um, so a lot of these are very similar for me, but cooking, reading, watching television, gardening, watching Netflix, uh, you know, watching movies, crafting, baking, uh, food, learning, exercise, gaming. Um, so it's been interesting. We've obviously talked a lot, Matt, about uh, kind of DIY at home when it comes to, you know, baking your own sourdough bread yeah. or uh, learning how to knit or anything <laughs> like that. So it's, it's, it's cool to see it kind of come up here again uh, when people think about what their favorite activities have been. People uh, love that bread. <laughs> I did buy bread machines, so I'm very excited to join yeah, that. Yeah, you were the perfect example, Abel. <laughs> uh, and then here, what are the innovations uh, you hope to see from brands uh, for your future home? So again, uh, things that help with your kitchen, cleaning, your family, um, smart devices, things that uh, appliances, security, um, things that help you clean. And, and they're looking for things that are um, high quality and also kind of affordable here as well. So, um, yeah, those are kind of the three questions that you all wanted to know about. Excellent. Thank cool. you, as always, Abel. So you want to maybe go into some of the Q&A? Yeah, so we've got lots of fun questions here. Um, Lindsay, this is a question for you, but through kind of the articles you've written, um, how are people really using their garages? Um, are you seeing any kind of changes in how that space is being used beyond just uh, doing a common oil change? Yeah, we actually did a story a couple months ago where people, um, these homeowners turned their garage into their kitchen and completely reorganized the layout. You would never have known that it was um, anything, you know, that it was a garage before, but now it's this gorgeous marble kitchen. So yes, I think, a, people are looking at it as an extension of their home and how can they, um, you know, make the most of that space as part of a whole layout. But then separately, I do think, you know, sheds were a thing um, already in terms of like, oh, you have your like little art studio or what have you. But now I think those spaces are being thought of as gyms or home offices. Um, so I think 100% garages are... Um, extra space that people are trying to make the most of. Definitely. Um, kind of similar question, but what about the home garden? Have you kind of seen any increase in popularity of that or yes. how that uh, has started? <laughs> well? Huge. Totally. Uh, we've done a lot of gardening content this year um, and actually indoor gardening too. It's not just having like a Martha Stewart level uh, plot of vegetables. People are looking for vertical solutions. Um, when they have a small space, what can they do with their windowsill? What can they do with their um, little balcony? And we did a really interesting story um, with a expert gardener on how you can grow a bunch of things within one pot that could make a whole meal. So I think, um, Gardening is not just for the suburban uh, reader. It's definitely for the city dweller as well. Definitely. Um, so kind of piggybacking on that question, if I'm a brand manager at a, uh, you know, a CPG company or a food and beverage company, I'm thinking about these spaces. Lindsay, what would be your recommendation for how they can really help uh, consumers who are trying to think about what to do with these spaces? Yeah, I think two things that come to mind right away. One is double duty, triple duty even um, products. And I think anything that can do multiple things, people are going to be absolutely obsessed with. So whether that's, we saw a really cool um, built-in 
shelving unit in someone's guest room where actually one little part of that shelving unit was a desk. So it was normally just a bookcase, um, but they have a little desk area that can like fold up and disappear. So like that kind of thing I think is really valuable right now. And I think also outdoor space, I know we talked about this um, at length today, but I think there's a, going to be a big opportunity with what outdoor space means come fall and winter. You know, people are seeing this as an extra room in their home, essentially, outside. Um, and so how can we extend that um, space into the winter? You know, fire pits, heaters, string lights, all that stuff, I think will be really important and people are, are going to want to stay outside as long as possible. Definitely. Uh, Matt, here's a question for you. Um, kind of while conducting this research, what has been the most surprising finding um, that you've really taken away from this? I think the finding about people hosting more has been, I think, uh, is surprising. You'd think that in this world where people don't want to leave, that they've almost become recluse. But the reality is that I think we all crave human connection um, mm -hmm. and the absence of having places where we can go spend time with other people or having an office where we can go see people, I think people have started to open up to hosting. And I think that's definitely the most surprising uh, data point that's come out of it for me. I was thinking about that again um, as we were just going through this and realizing also many of my 20 something um, colleagues, you know, went immediately home to their parents' houses as soon as this happened and haven't come back yet. So I think it's also hosting long-term visitors too, as well as, as little gatherings. Definitely. Um, here's a question specifically about bathrooms. So everyone's curious about all the different rooms and how they're gonna shift, but um, I'm hearing a lot of research that a lot of moms are escaping to their bathrooms for showers <laughs> away from their kids. Um, what do you yes. think the shifting functionality of bathrooms might be? Yes, the, the bathroom is the new spa, Abel. Um, <laughs> I think people are really, you know, Privacy is now not, you know, a guarantee at home. Um, you are doing everything, you know, right next to your partner or your kids. And so I think bathrooms, um, people are really looking at least on our site for so, like easy solutions for how to upgrade their space. So it really feels like a sanctuary, whether that's, you know, there's stick on tiles for your floor to make, you know, a dingy rental floor look nice, or maybe you're hanging a plant in your, some eucalyptus in your shower to make it smell nice. Um, so I think for sure, um, we've seen, well, I know, you know, you guys know, wellness is such a big industry now. And I think that just is, it coincides with that. Definitely. Um, kind of a follow-up question for you, Matt. Um, so I know this question was specifically about moms and, and parents, but do we have any more research about parents um, coming up or anything like that? Oh. Uh, so <laughs> we actually have our next webinar, State of the Consumer 11, I'm glad you asked Abel, is on, um, <laughs> is on back to school and how parents are really, um, you know, prepping for back to school. Uh, we have a special guest from Crayola uh, that's going to be talking about what they're seeing from the consumer in terms of back to school preparation. So um, that's coming up on August 24th at 1 p.m. So uh, if you want to register um, as Abel uh, in his infinite wisdom popped up a box <laughs> on our screen, I will allow you to register yeah, now. That so was high tech. Time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. So we're looking forward to that. Absolutely. Um, okay, I think next question here for Matt. So even if gyms do open up, obviously we've seen kind of a rise in the trend of working from uh, working out from home, you know, the rise of the Pelotons. Um, yeah. Do you still think that home gyms will stay a necessary room uh, after people start going back to the gym? I think if, if it works for people and people, I mean, it's all about efficacy in, in, in exercise, right? And it, whatever people figure out what works for them, gets them to follow a routine and gives them the results that they want, that's what they're going to stick with. So it's a given a lot of these companies um, like Mirror and Peloton and SoulCycle Home, et cetera, the ability to really redefine consumer habits. And if they find it's easier for them to roll out of the bed and jump on an exercise bike to basically get that ongoing exercise, well, then that will become the way that they work out and they won't find the need for the extra expense of a home gym. So I think it creates a big opportunity. I think some people still want to be around other people and they look at it as more of a social activity going to the gym. Um, but a lot of the companies that actually have physical gyms, they might not survive coming out of this. So I think there's going to be tremendous change. And I do think it, it creates a big opportunity. Obviously, many people have homes that they don't have enough space for that type of equipment either. So I think there's good, but there's definitely be a lot of disruption coming out of that in the fitness space for sure. 
definitely. There's also, think, there's also influence, fitness influencers that are creating content and things like I that. I was going to say all about those IGTV um, workouts. You know, yeah. I think if you miss classes, you, that's one thing that has come out of this is you can take a class virtually. So it'll be interesting to see if people keep doing those when, when things open up. Definitely. And I think this is actually kind of a follow-up question to this, um, but clearly someone who kind of works in the health and wellness space uh, asking, uh, how can we really develop products to kind of meet this need of the rising at home gym? Or do you think there's really any opportunities here for brands that are not necessarily just making the physical uh, workout equipment? Um, I mean, I think there's so much opportunity. I think there's consumers need to understand what type of equipment can fit best in their space and where it should go in their space. They want to understand what the right regimen is, how to integrate home fitness into their lifestyle, how to make it more of a family-based activity, what other ancillary accessories or equipment may be needed. Um, so I think if I'm a brand like Gatorade, I'm figuring out ways to, to get my brand to be a part of this, right? And so I think there's there's many different um, and then what is, what does personal training look like? What does a one-to-one -one fitness coach look like in a virtual environment? Um, and, and what products and services can come out of that as well? Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so Matt, one of the questions that people had as we were kind of doing the demo is, can you tell us a little bit about the audience that's responding to these Suzy surveys? Sure. So Suzy has its own proprietary panel of over a million U.S. consumers um, that census weighted for census-based criteria, whether it be gender or age or, or um, in income or geographic disbursement. Um, and these consumers are rewarded for the ability to answer questions on behalf of our clients. Um, all questions from clients who use Suzy are delivered to the panel in an anonymous format. So the consumers aren't biased. They don't know who's actually asking the question. And we have a great network of consumers who really just love giving feedback to brands and we've been building this now over the last seven years and um, I've been very fortunate to be able to create this really powerful network which brands are using to really direct their decisions on an everyday basis and so that companies really become much more consumer centric really across all industries um, and we have a whole team an audience team that's focused on making sure that we are building a, a, a network that's balanced the census and most importantly people that are real people and not bots and, and really providing high quality answers that our customers can trust to help make them their own business decisions. Awesome. Um, so Lindsay, a question here for you. I know we talked a little bit about how, uh, you know, creating these rooms are for specific features. What do you think uh, the Zoom room of the future might look like and how can a the brand Zoom room. into that? Um, oh gosh. Well, I'm a horrible example, but I think that the Zoom room is going to have like a really chic bookcase situation behind it with like beautiful, uh, maybe they're going to be a color, like a green or something. But anyway, all that to say, I think people want um, a backdrop, a beautiful backdrop. So I think some kind of um, insta wall installation is going to be key. And then, as I said, um, soundproofing maybe even you know partitions are a big thing like a room divider that you know you can separate yourself especially if you're in a more open concept space you can separate yourself while you're in your zoom room and then you can open things back up when you don't want to um, be in meetings anymore um so that and then um yeah i think lighting is key as well i think um maybe people are going to have those like influencer ring lights in their space to make them look really good on their calls and their interviews um, but I think all of those things are key, um, to, you know, just being productive. Oh, and plants, plants are good for productivity too, and making you happy. Awesome. And I know Matt, you've obviously have, uh, the zoom room set up already. Yeah, so Matt is, Matt's got the artwork. He's got the <laughs> studio already. Um, okay, cool. So my next question here is what are home products that you think will be super hot uh, are that are currently super hot that would never have been if we weren't in a COVID-19 situation. So Matt, you want to take that question? Yeah. I mean, we've seen a resurgence of products like um, webcams where webcams for a while wasn't much demand and this started many consumers realized the best way to work on zoom and other platforms was to have two monitors and not work off their small laptops. So they needed webcams and that was tremendous demand. Things like bread makers, we never thought people would want. So I think when you talk about people preparing their own stuff, we saw a huge demand in people, you know, making whether it be bread makers or pizza makers or ice cream makers, you know, it used to be reserved for just sort of this artisanal 
craft community and now it's sort of be become much more mainstream so those are the things that come to mind um and obviously much more a high end to lindsay's point um audio video equipment that people need in the home as they try to recreate you know a home office that really is suitable to the professional image that they want to create and paint and paint always and lindsay i know uh, when we were talking you mentioned a specific company uh, that's really focusing on paint for millennials. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm sure some of um, your list, our listeners already know it, but Backdrop is a startup paint company. Um, and we did a story on them in April where we uh, reached out to see, you know, what colors of paint were selling out and just, you know, how their sales were doing. Um, and they saw a huge increase in certain colors, an earthy pink, a dark blue green shade actually. So, you know, a lot of people go for white um, or cream, but these bolder colors saw an 800% increase, which is crazy and sold out twice. So um, as I was saying, I think a paint is a really easy upgrade, but also, you know, one of the things I keep thinking about with this pandemic is it's really uh, shone a light on, shined a light on, um, how emotional interior design is and how it can really impact your well-being and your mood. Um, and things like a, the color of your walls can really change how you feel on a, on a, on a given day. So I think these really energizing, um, optimistic colors are seeing an uptick, which is really nice. Definitely. Um, here's another question for you, Lindsay, but kind of through um, your research, have you seen that home decor spend has peaked? Um, and that it will remain higher than pre-pandemic um, or, or kind of have you started to see a decline in kind of how people are spending? I mean, we're, we're a publisher, so I can't totally <laughs> give you <laughs> data on that. But just for anecdotally, I think I don't think it's changing anytime soon. I think people are really uh, realizing the importance of their surroundings and as I was saying and how they feel and especially you know you have to stare at your space now 24 7 so if there's something you've been wishing to change it's right in your face so I think people are going to continue to invest in their homes at least through the end of the year for sure um, but yeah I, I don't know I can't tell the future but I, I would say it's going to continue definitely um, here another question for you Lindsay uh, what about other space saving design elements like drop leaf and Murphy beds? Are you seeing more of those um, as people kind of convert yeah. other parts of their homes um, for other functionalities? Yeah. Um, are, you know, smart ways. Do you have any thoughts on that? I definitely think, I mean, I, a drop leaf table in a small studio apartment is a lifesaver as is a Murphy bed. I think the key there and what the reader is really looking for is how to make those stylish. And so I think any brand that can put a contemporary twist on these kind of, you know, they might have a bad rap because they've been around a while and um, modernizing them. I think people are definitely looking for those solutions where things can be changed as you're using a space, um, you know, making the table bigger when you're having your sister over for dinner, making it smaller when you're cooking, et cetera, I think is just totally key. Definitely. Uh, and that's really all the questions from the audience that we have right now. Awesome. That was well, a lot. Yeah, Damn. no. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, on behalf of Lindsay uh, and myself, Lindsay, first of all, thank you for joining. It was great. We'll have to do this again sometime. Thanks for and, having me. That was fun. Yeah. You obviously have a lot of expertise that um, our audience wants to know, so we'd love to have you back. So thank you for joining. Abel, thank you as always to you and the team for helping put us together. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining us. Our 10th edition of the State of the Consumer webinar. Again, feel free to um, follow up with any questions you need via email. Um, and don't forget about our next webinar, um, which is coming up on August 24th at 1 p.m., where we talk about how to prepare for an uncertain school year with our special guests uh, from Crayola. So on behalf of myself, um, and the entire Susie team, as well as Lindsay from Domino Magazine. want to thank you guys for joining. I'm so glad you guys got value out of this. And until next time, stay safe, everyone. And we'll see everyone soon. Take care. Thank you.